How do I know when we're actually live? It will tell you. Plus, I'm looking at it on my phone, but it's muted, so I can, like, Good see. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I think we may be live. I think we may be actually live. Uh, good afternoon, planet Earth. Uh, this is Kathy Hay. I'm here with three of my dear friends who dress like, well, not like I do, but dress funny like I do. Um, hello, everybody. I see you all in the chat. We've got, good Lord, we've got 795 people here already. Hello, everybody. Um, so we are going to do a class this afternoon on confidence, how to put yourself out there. Um, this is particularly in the context of dressing historically, but you will probably find um, enough to go on here to give you confidence in whatever you want to do. This is just one example to, to go out and dress in the way you want to. So I hope there'll be lots to inspire you today and lots to show you that this maybe isn't as difficult as you might have thought it was. It isn't quite as complicated or it doesn't require maybe quite as much courage as you might have thought it did. So I am going to introduce, first of all, the fabulous Bernadette Banner. So would you tell us, Bernadette, who you are? I mean, we've got we've got a few people here, possibly who don't already know who you are. So. Hi, hello friends. I am Bernadette Banner. I have a YouTube channel in which I make historical dress. Is that sufficient? Yeah. I wear historical dress. No, I don't. I wear historical-ish dress. Yeah. Well, yes. One person's ish is another person's historically accurate, I suppose. But... No. There is only one history. Well, I guess that's debatable. Anyway. Well, I feel the same way. Everybody, people come up to, well, anyway, we'll get into that. But so we have Bernadette here, who has a YouTube channel with Sorry. now three quarters of a million followers about historical sewing. We also that. have uh, Zach Pinsent here. Would you like to introduce yourself, sir? Hello, uh, my name is Zach Pinsent. Um, I only wear historical clothing, as I think you can all attest. Um, I make it, I sort of present on it. Um, I've got a YouTube channel, which I have done very little on, but I plan to do more. Um, but I'm more sort of active uh, on Instagram and the such like. So, yeah, yeah, I suppose that's that's sort of that. Yeah. Professionally, you are a tailor. So. Oh, yeah, there's that. There's that. that. Yeah. <laughs> Just a small detail. Yes. Um, and so welcome to both of you. And we also, you may have noticed, we also have a special surprise guest, uh, you know, just to add a little bit of extra spice. Uh, we have Constance McKenzie here. Would you like to introduce yourself as well, Constance? Hello, I'm Constance. I am a costume maker for theatre, film and TV. And I also dress however I want all the time. Um, uh, people often mistakenly think I actually am living in the past because I live in an old house. I don't like some modern appliances, so I don't buy them and I don't use them. But actually, you know, I love the fact that I've got the whole of history to choose from and I can pick whatever bit suits me today and whatever bit suits me tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So, and you probably you've probably heard, heard, heard of Victorian often. swear. What's that? You haven't lived until you've heard of Victorian swear. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a big post-it note saying don't swear up here because it's <laughs> I've got quite a lot of lives coming up and it's a <laughs> new experience. I, I think it will it will probably be forgiven if you do don't worry. Um, so what we're going to do this afternoon we're going to talk about confidence I've got a few questions you've probably got questions too uh, we're going to keep questions until the end just so that we don't go off on a million tangents and just get lost uh, on tangents um it's going it is going to be a class about confidence and historical dressing and putting yourself out there um so as bernadette said yesterday in our class about worth it's not a place for personal questions we're not gonna you know we're not gonna take questions about cesario you know so it's gonna be just keep it on topic so today we are gonna get into a little bit of the background behind dressing historically or dressing in an, any sort of unusual vintage any way that's going to stick out because so i think as a lot of us all four of us get comments all the time about 
I'd really love to do this, but I'm scared of doing it. I'm scared of what people think. I'm scared of what my family thinks. I don't know what people are going to do when I walk out dressed like this. I don't know how to get the wardrobe to get how do you start getting the wardrobe together i don't know how to get the wardrobe together because it looks like all of us just bounced out of bed one day and started doing this and it doesn't quite happen like that so i want to go through a little bit of the backstory for each of you so tell us a little bit about the story that got you here because it all develops it didn't just suddenly happen one day did it bernadette Oh, absolutely not. No. Um, I may not be the best place to start. I admittedly don't have much memory of prior to the past 10 years. So I can't say like, this is where I came from. And when I was young, I thought this, I have none of that. I have found literally like 10 minutes ago when we were on this chat, I dug up a photograph of me in high school. And I do recall I was sort of, I was unashamed in high school. Um, I wasn't like concerned with wanting to be part of a group of people because I just, I mean, I was weird and I knew that and I just couldn't be bothered trying to dress in a way that would make me fit in with a certain group of people. So I just kind of wore whatever I want and just went on with life and so it was kind of like I didn't know anything about history um I didn't have you know there wasn't costume there wasn't you know an internet there were internet forums and stuff but I wasn't really on the internet to that extent so I didn't have this sort of online community of people giving me ideas and where can I go to look for research and stuff so um wait I can screen share can I do mm -hmm. this yeah so there's me um, circa, actually, I don't know. Wow. Where yeah, I know. <laughs> I've not looked at this photograph probably since it was taken, but I have an old folder in my computer that's like, oh, here's a old stuff that you probably don't want to look at. But anyway, so this is a jacket that I stole from my sibling because um, Danny never wore it. And I was like, this is awesome. It looks so Victorian. I'm going to steal it and I'm going to wear it, as you can see. It doesn't fit at all. This is actually when I was, I had, uh, well, I have scoliosis, if you don't know. So I wear, I wore a um, correctional brace for many, many years. And so I am actually wearing this brace under this. And that, again, I'm not clear on my origin of interest in historical dress. However, I like to accredit this brace as sort of the first thing that drew the connection between, you know, corsetry, Victorian dress, historical dress. So yeah, I am wearing that under this. There was a whole like, I do have, because I did adopt the layers of Victorian dress sort of by default. I wore the under chemise layer and then I wore the, um, corset and then now we'll wore stuff over top of it because I wasn't just going to wear my corset out you know in the open for everyone to see because to me it was an undergarment the brace oh. is an undergarment obviously so, um, so and then I, I it, that you were um you were launched into it anyway because you had to wear this strange thing kind of it or not so you might as well <laughs> go with it right it usual I mean I guess I'm creating narratives here because I don't know what truth of the past was if that even exists but you know it was my decision to adopt the unusual aspects of victorian or what my, in my head victorian dress was which was you know <laughs> sort of early 2000s goth trash steampunk yeah it was all sort of one giant mishmash of aesthetic if that was even a word back, back then. But, you know, I didn't have a full Victorian wardrobe. I actually did have a friend in high school who did dress full Victorian, like long skirt and- Yeah. Oh, amazing. Uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't Victorian as now that I know today, but she ordered it all off the internet, but it was fantastic and it was great. Um, she did that her last year of school. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I didn't own actual Victorian clothes. So I'm just pairing it with things from my wardrobe, things that I like found at Hot Topic you know, online, <laughs> <laughs> and it just sort of got thrown together to be this sort of weird goth trash Victorian thing. Well, um, it's experimentation, isn't it? Yeah, so I was, 
quite unashamed in high school. Um, that did calm down a bit when I started working in theater. I was like, I guess I need to be professional now. Yeah. Um, however, I still only wore black, white, and red for mm -hmm. a while and like tones. So yeah. um, this was me going a bit uh, more traditional. It was not normal. I ended up going a bit more 20th century vintage for a while because I was like, I don't want to wear modern clothes. I don't like modern clothes. And I was still wearing the brace at this point. So uh, actually not at this point in the show, but for the first fourth that I was working in the theater, I was still wearing it. So there was still a necessity for the layering, uh, but I didn't go Victorian. I just, you know, ended up sort of mid-century, uh, which involved a lot of like A-line dresses, um, which I wasn't hugely like, it didn't feel the most to me, but it was at least it wasn't modern clothing. So I guess like the last, well, the earlier part of what? The, po the point when I moved to New York and started working was a, a different point of figuring stuff out because I knew that I, or I perceived that I couldn't dress as weirdly uh, yeah. gothic Victorian as I did as a teenager, but at the same time, I didn't want to wear modern clothes because, because it wasn't me. Like it, it yeah. didn't make me feel right. So um, this happened for a while and then then I just sort of gave up and I was like, you know what, I'm just going back to Edwardian. This is just yeah. what I enjoy. This is what I feel comfortable in. And how did that happen? You didn't just wake up one day and go, no, no, no I'm going to do Edwardian. No, absolutely. Was there one piece of clothing that you began with? Was there like one skirt or one blouse? It's like, yeah, I'm going to wear that. And it just kind of started something? Um, well, I did learn how to sew, which helped. Mm -hmm. because once you have the power of learning of knowing how to sew it's like oh, I can make anything that I want what do I want to make oh I want to make stuff like this and, you know you go on Pinterest and yeah. you start compiling like wardrobe goals and then all of a sudden you look at it and you see oh wow my style is really Edwardian this is mm -hmm. like this is the answer I guess yeah um but I did have I was like naturally attracted to long stuff long dresses just because, I mean, it has been in my nature for the majority of my existence to cover up as much as I can. Yeah. Just because, because of all the weirdness going on. And then, you know, I also don't like to expose my arms. I also don't like to expose my legs. <laughs> so it's like, well, I, I should just dress like a Victorian. The problem solved. Yeah. But so it developed in a way organically, but also, I mean, Pinterest is a really useful tool. If you pin, pin just a bunch of stuff you like, you can then look back at that Pinterest board and go, oh, look at that. That's my style then. Yes. So I hope if you're watching this, you're sort of taking notes on, ah, yeah, I could do that. So you can go to Pinterest and start dreaming and just thinking, oh, yeah, I see how I could. And you've probably got, whether you, you, you might already have a couple of things in your wardrobe that are like, oh, that's kind of on the way to something, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there were definitely articles in my wardrobe that I would gravitate towards naturally. And yeah. those just happened to be the skirts that I had made myself because yeah. I had designed them exactly the length that I want them. I had made them out of fabrics that I really love. And so I realized like, wait, you know, what I love is what I can come up with myself. Yeah. That's it. And then it just evolves from there and when you get online and you start posting stuff on Instagram, it looks like you just sprang forth fully formed as an Edwardian, but there was this whole journey that happened before that. From that right. of, well, I'm not going to be in what everybody else is in. And well, I think people nowadays are kind of, I don't want to say at a disadvantage, but in a different position because social media, visual sharing of media, I should say, like Instagram and YouTube are so much more of a thing amongst the social yeah. media world. Like when I was in high school, it was like MySpace and Live Journal, which was all anonymous. So it's not like, hi, I'm Bernadette Banner on Instagram. This is my face and these are my clothes. Yes. So if you are just, if you're still trying to figure out your style, like that's a little bit of a, I don't want to say it's a disadvantage. It's just, again, it's a different circumstance because you are exposing more of your journey whereas i've kind of figured out my style now now i have instagram now i have a public platform and these are the pictures that you're seeing you're not seeing the pictures 
that I'm digging out of my toxic waste do not open folder on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it is, I hope you're seeing, it's a whole journey. It doesn't have to, you don't have to present yourself like fully personally branded from the start. You know, you and you're not supposed to. to, like that's not how it's yeah. supposed to work. It's just, I think that's an expectation of this particular era of the internet in particular, where the people who have these platforms are the people who have figured it out. But maybe it's just a matter of development in that further down the line, as more people start to expose their actual journeys, it will become less of an expectation to be fully mm -hmm. formed and more yes. accessible to have a more, uh, an evolution well, in social media. Well, also, everybody watching has an advantage over us in that they will be better placed to coach the next generation in how to do this because they're not going to be they're not they're not going to be giving the impression that this all just happens by magic they're going to be able to help people you sometimes forget when you're starting a journey that there are going to be people behind you on the road that you're going to be able to help so being able to show that journey i think in a way is an advantage for this whole community to be able to see each other developing. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Ben. So, Zach. Hello. What's your <laughs> dressing unusually? You, um, were, you were in like historical baby grows, weren't you? Yeah, pretty much. No, no. Well, well, I will never forgive my parents for not dressing me up as little Lord Colteroy. <laughs> um, so, so, so there's just some things you know some really tough things you got to hold on to no so i i do get asked this question a lot and i've never really you know i address it occasionally but but it's particularly tricky because um i've always been odd um and as i think we all have well you could say odd but i suppose just more comfortable in my own skin uh, really, and more sort of confident in that. Um, you know, so so when I was much, much younger, um, I would, so if we were going on a school trip to a castle, I would naturally dress up as a knight. <laughs> um, when we went on a little school trip to a um, Victorian manor house thing to see, you know, how the Victorians lived, I went as a butler. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's natural. Um, as far as I'm concerned. So, so it sort of grew from the love of occasion, the love of dressing up and the love of just the sheer joy of doing it. And you grow up a bit and the peer pressure sort of comes in a bit and you're sort of going, oh, I still like it. But on, uh, well, because being in the UK, we have school uniforms, very much like Hogwarts, um, but not as flowy. And um, it would mean that on days like a charity day where you'd pay, you know, a few pounds to wear your um, home clothes. Um, oh, on So on one of those days, it was a charity thing. And it was also, you know, come in as what you want to be when you're older. So it was a dress up thing as well. So I came along as, as a Victorian undertaker. <laughs> um so I was a really macabre child, um, loved the Christopher Lee Draculas um, and everything. Uh, so, so it came from that dark, spooky, um, sort of, this is really cool. Everyone's like, oh, vampires. And I'm like, this is really cool. And then Twilight sort of came on uh, onto the scene years later and ruined everything. <laughs> so... Um, and, <laughs> no, no. Uh, so, so it all came from the love of dressing up. And the way I got into it first off um, was I had a few pieces in the dressing up box, but I wouldn't really wear them about. So I first started um, getting a few vintage pieces, but they were sort of disconnected. Like I couldn't afford a full suit or anything like that. So we were moving house, I was 14, and I found my great, great, great grandfather's um, three piece suit from the 20s and 30s. Um, you know, so I've had a few of them. And they fitted me like a glove. Uh, and that was like, great, this is my base. Um, because I wanted to do more of it. And I'd experimented with like bits of white tie. See, I, I was just trying to trawl through my phone to find stuff. 
Um, but yeah, it's all the, so, 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 cannot find it anywhere. Um, and it's a, a friend's wedding. Yeah. And, you know, all the kids were going to just be in, because it was a summer wedding, uh, were going to be in like smartish trousers, mm -hmm. trainers, um, some of which had light up trainers, which was amazing, mm -hmm. um, and just a shirt uh, or a blouse or whatever. Um, me, on the other hand, I was like, I need a waistcoat and a bow tie, like <laughs> the wedding. <Please. laughs> so, so there's a little oh, baby God. Zach, and just like, I'm oh. loving it. I'm loving it, and then wearing the mother of the bride's hat because it looked awful. The strange how the shades of the, the picture from the Vogue shoot with that huge hat on. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that was a great. So. What's really cool about those photos, in, in fact, for those that haven't seen, uh, for visual, for reference de visual. Um, oh my God, I have so many photos on here. I mean, it's mainly of just braid, but okay. So, so that photo from the Vogue shoot, yeah. that hat um, is by Dolce & Gabbana, but, yeah. the, um, but it was so windy that mm. day that, the, like every five moments it was going <laughs> so 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 when they were sort of setting up the shot and fiddling with makeup and stuff and everything i was sat on a uh yellow velvet chaise long behind everyone you know wearing my silk banyan and then i decided to put the hat on it was great um and um yeah there's a really cool shot of that which which was fun um which was this one yes that's you know. Sunshine. So it started off from dressing up and buying vintage pieces and then it and then just drop my phone. It's casual. Um it, so it started off with vintage pieces um and trying to expand from there. Um and just a real drive to do it, you know. So it was tricky, you know. Um I at school I didn't have really any friends full stop. So it was a case of, well, why should I adhere to a peer group or a society or a way of being which I don't like and clearly doesn't want to know me? So it was a case of, I've got nothing to lose. Um, I might as well do what I love. And my parents are very supportive of this. I'm very, very lucky in that um, but because my dad, um, who, who is wonderful, uh, he was seen as the black sheep of his family, but he's the most normal one in ours. Um, well, normal. Um, and so he picked me up from school occasionally. Um, well, no, he'd always been picked up from school. So he picked me up from school and, and he might be wearing jeans, cowboy boots and a biker jacket and then like a funny T-shirt or something because it's just like, cool. Oh, yeah. You know, so there's always been that individualism uh, and the whole sort of notion of self-expression that has been allowed. Um, and they've always been really supportive with it. But it is that whole thing that you then get to a point and I was invited to an, uh, a Regency ball. I didn't have anything to wear. And up until that point, the only sewing experience I'd had was with repairing some of the vintage pieces that I had. So it was like sewing a button back on, re-sewing yeah. a seam, you know, so little things like that. Um, and that slow and steady approach of understanding construction and even just simple things like seeing how that, how that thing is sewn and, and whatnot. So I ended up just taking all the seams of this tailcoat I got online um, to make my first Regency outfit, which is not great. But I paired it admittedly with a silk top hat, um, small little pumps, um and like um an antique moire waistcoat from like the 1860s or something yeah. um, because i was huge into getting these you know because i love the victorian aesthetic because you could still get things fairly readily available yeah. now it's much harder and um, you know within the last sort of you know five six years there isn't the same sort of deluge of good vintage clothing yeah accessible that there used to be um, it used to be a case of, you know, you could go on eBay and buy a few lovely original waistcoats and stuff, but there seems to be fewer and far between now. Mm. I don't know why. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, those sorts of things sort of started me off on my um, 
sort of journey of dressing. Um, and I've just always enjoyed it. And, you know, people, so, you know, people always used to say, oh, you do it for attention. And I said, well, if I did it for attention, I'd do something which required a lot less time, effort, yeah. and skill and all that stuff. But, you know, pe people immediately assume that if you're not like them, there'll be something wrong about you or something weird. And, you know, it's sort of like, why can't you just let people just enjoy themselves? Yeah. What a crazy concept. It's funny, we've got a lot of talk in the, in the chat about bullies. And I'm noticing, and I think I've noticed yeah. a lot, a lot of us who do this or have a more unusual approach to life, we're the kids who were bullied back in school. We're the kids who had something different about us. And we all got to a point where as well, fuck it, we may as well do what we want. They hate you anyway. They're not going to hate you any less or more if you dress how you want. Actually, they'll probably hate you more because you're being happy and successful and people hate that, but. Yeah. I know, well, love that. You better. <laughs> I know. Well, I particularly to say to anybody, I know I have followers who are like in high school, in college, and yeah. it's a huge, it feels awful now, and it's really difficult now, but in a funny sort of way, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me self-reliant yeah. and it made me not care as much what people thought. It made me not live in a way that I'm always trying to fit in with everybody else. It gave me that sense of, well, I've got nothing to lose. So I might as well do whatever the heck I want. But also, well, do you find that nowadays there are more people who appreciate what you do than people who hate what you do? Yes. I think so, yeah. Well, people certainly appreciate, I mean, we'll get into my story later, but um, the things that made me different in high school are now things that make me unusual and to be celebrated. So, I mean, there's more about that later. So let's talk to Constance. Hello. What's your story? Um, it's in some ways similar to Zach. I recognise a lot of what he's saying there of, of the dressing up for the occasion um, because you wanted to and because how else could you enjoy something unless you're you know really involved in it. I was home educated by my parents so I didn't even go to school or wear a school uniform. So oh, for a lot of children there's a transition in their life where their parents go oh you're going to school now and in England again wearing a school uniform. Mm. No you can't wear the tutu or the princess dress anymore. You've got to put the proper clothes on and go to school. I never had that moment. So I just never stopped. I always wore exactly what I wanted to wear, whether it was what was in the dressing up box or what I put on that morning. And what I realized as well, I'm thoroughly influenced by what I'm reading or what I'm watching. So if I was reading a book and there was a character in it and their clothes were described, especially if it was a Victorian story or, well, Anyway, um, yes, or if I watched a film with a particular character that I liked the way I looked, I would go and rummage through the dressing up box and my clothes and anybody else's clothes that were lying around if it would suit my purposes. <laughs> and I would dress, I would dress up in and try and try and achieve that look that I liked. And then um, you're talking about like, so I didn't get bullied at school because there was no one ever really to say you don't fit in. My parents said, no, you, you, you're fine like that, whatever. But at about 11 or 12, you know, life transitions a bit anyway, and I came into contact with more children who started to say, oh, there's something not right about you, you're weird. But at the same year, I discovered historical reenactment at Kentwell Hall, which is 16th century, which is my other big obsession, history and clothing wise. And in order to take part, you had to make the clothes so that, and I wanted to go, my mum was like, well, I don't sew, but you do. You're gonna have to make the clothes for us to go. And I got there and, you know, I made my first clothes out of blankets and sheets. And, and fortunately, you're not judged for that because everyone knows you have to start somewhere and that you know, this is your first year, this is your entry level. And then, you know, by the time you're leaving, you're going, oh, next year, I'll make something better. And yeah, yeah I spent the rest of my teenage years, all my spare time at Kempwell. And it didn't, I didn't care what I looked like in the rest of the world because when I was there, I felt, felt like me. So my, if I can screen share a picture, there are not many. Do you know how to do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can... Button in the middle of the bottom of the screen, if you take mm. it down there, it'll show a green button saying share screen. I've got that. Well, you, you, okay. you, you, you've sort of brought up something which, um, which, which sort of works quite well in, in the fact that with growing up, you you're not part of anything. So you don't have your sort of safe space community. So you create your own, even if it's yourself. 
Yes. And part of that is through a dress sense. Um, you know, I think I, I think that's something that people sort of gravitate to. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's a picture of here or not. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. If, see if you see above the picture to the left of the top left hand corner, there's a little magnifying glass with a plus on it. That will probably blow it up a bit. Oh, something else has got is now popping up and being irritating. No. Oh dear. On the top left hand corner of the picture itself. That's a little one. Make it go bigger. Yeah. There you go. Oh, baby, can't do The slightly <laughs> southern-looking southern one here is me. This is how I look for most of my teens. Yeah. Like, this is my friend Tamsin, who I make a lot of costumes for, and this is how long yeah. we've known each other. <laughs> wow. So that's how I looked for a lot of my teens. In the evening, you take the hat off, and I used to change my shoes because I didn't like my Tudor shoes. I still don't like my Tudor shoes, although there are some yeah. lovely ones out there. Um, and I'm done getting rid of that, but... There were some people who, as soon as the reenacting day was over, they went and got changed into how they were comfortable, but I didn't. I stayed how I felt comfortable. Yeah. And if we went out in the evening from the manor, I'd stay dressed like that. And, mm -hmm. I, and I loved it. And I didn't, I did have things I wanted to achieve outside of that, but it didn't really matter because that was how I felt comfortable. And that's how I wanted to dress all the time. And then through doing that reenactment, you discover other reenactments. So I met a lot of people who did 1940s reenactment. Um, and some of them did appear, because that is a more modern style, and again, it was, I was very interested in the history, it's always the history that does bring me there, but I did meet people who did wear those clothes all the time, and that sort of made me think, oh, well, I could do that mm -hmm. too, and I started looking for stuff, but I mean, I couldn't, vintage clothes has always been expensive, and yeah. I never wanted stuff that would just do, I always wanted stuff that was right, you know, and a lot of stuff gets mislabeled, so I really wanted stuff that was 1940s, so I couldn't really find it. I had a couple of pieces. Um, yeah, and that, and obviously I liked making costume for reenacting, so that leads you to making your own clothes, which I've been dabbling in anyway. I started buying the vintage Vogue patterns, which were reprint patterns, and doing a dressmaker's class in my teens as well. Because at that point I knew how to make 16th century clothes, and I knew a little bit how to make dressing up clothes. So then I sort of thought, oh, now I need to learn to make the clothes I actually want to wear. So yeah, so I did then go on to study uh, costume for theatre and film, not theatre really, but I was quite, because I couldn't achieve, I was quite, I was being a bit perfectionist, because I didn't feel I was achieving what I wanted, I wasn't wearing full 1940s clothes, I wasn't wearing the Tudor clothes all the time, I sort of gave up on my own appearance a bit, and I sort of almost put on that thing of, well it doesn't matter what I look like, because the whole point of my job is to make other people look, you look good. Right. But it was really, I was like, oh, I can't do it as well as I want to. So I didn't yeah. really try. I still didn't look like other people. I was vaguely a rockabilly at the time, but never did that with the full the full commitment. I think also it's like playing by the rules often annoyed me as well. I used to, even when I used to go to the rockabilly clubs a bit later on, I used to quite like wearing something that wasn't rockabilly because it annoyed them somewhere. So wearing yeah. golf clothes to a rockabilly dance. Yeah. Or, because bizarrely, some people go, ah, oh, 40s, 50s, it's all the same. And some people go, no, no, we really are only into the 50s. We're not fussed by the 40s. And some of the 40s ones are like, no, we're only into the 40s. We're not interested in the 50s. And sometimes it's all a nice, big, glorious muddle. And for sometimes you get into a group like that, like Rockabilly thing, and there's, there's like a uniform develops. Oh, yeah. Everybody has the same pieces. So you yeah. kind of go the opposite way. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I like that. Huh? I liked the fact that uh, this was when I was at college, I was a rockabilly and there were no other rockabillies there. So I didn't look like anybody else. But almost then when you go to the places where it was full of people dressed like that, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to blend in. But again, I'm not, I wasn't doing it because I wanted to be looked at because actually I was quite dissatisfied with the way I looked. But yeah, I knew that there was something I was aiming for. And I'm oh, sorry, I've gone very roundabout because there's more, more of a point I want to make. Um, so once I started working in theatre, this is where I joke, I became a goth by default, because if you work backstage, you have to wear black. Yeah. <laughs> so it just became the fact of, well, if I wear black all day, it doesn't matter what I do in the day that might be a mucky job. It doesn't matter if I have to work backstage in the evening. I'm always covered for the occasion. And I loved that yeah. as well. I'd always had a gothic, gothic tendency as well. Yeah. Um, and it was only when I changed, changed jobs from working in one theatre where I really was 
doing you know everything involved in costume you know from the making the dressing the washing the breaking down out in the garden with spray paint distressing costumes you know backstage mm -hmm. dressing it was only when I moved to working at a different theatre where I only made costumes in the workroom and you weren't expected to go backstage uh, it was that, it, that was the sort of time where I thought perhaps I can start dressing more how I want to now I had a little bit more free time and that's when I, I'd already am amassed a selection of clothes that I liked, but then it was a case of, right, I want the nerve to wear them. I mean, like moving to a new place is a quite a good time to start going, all right, I can start being somebody else now. I can start being who I think I want to be because there's a new, I moved to that job. So also I sort of did create another. And then you're going to laugh at this bit, Kathy, but then it was going on the Sense and Sensibility tour in 2012. I was just thinking about that, yeah. Where it Can I was, tell this story? Yeah, go about on. how a good day I met you. The yeah. first day of the Sense and Sensibility Store. Now, I think that everybody who goes on that tour would agree and say that many of the people on that tour and the, the, the crowd involved in that are interested in history, but quite conservative, some of them. And I think they would be uh, proud to say that. They, they, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of putting them down in that way. But you were dressed. This is the first time I met you. We went into this tea and you were dressed in this very, um, this white shirt and a, a brown skirt and your hair was just back in a very like conservative sort of way. And I, I just, and I was trying to fit in and I sat down next to you and we started talking about what radio station we listened to while we're sewing. And we were like, yeah, Radio 4, yeah. And I'm like, well, I actually listen to Planet Rock quite a lot. And Constance was like, so do I. I'm like, hang on. And I'm looking at her up and down and she's like, oh, this, this is a disguise. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a case of dressing for the group, for the people you're gonna be with and trying to fit in with a group just on that particular occasion. Yeah. So I was, I knew immediately that was a, an, um, a case of playing with dress for the occasion and, and being something that you play with and it and really, really when you started on that trip it was because I had like a whole week where I had to pack for the whole week it ended with the dressing up in the regency clothes but I thought the whole week I've got to be there I want to look I want to fit in with the group they like you to be smart when you travel so that we're treated you know nicely while you're doing things they like the overall look of that it was I was very into the vintage style and I thought well this is my opportunity to pack all of my clothes that work together that I know work together and wear them in that week and see how it goes and again I'm somewhere new I'm with people I don't really know this is this is my experiment to see if I can do it and that week was so successful I haven't looked back <laughs> yeah and that and was it, it. And you just started dressing like that all the time. Yeah. So. And I want to point out, you know, I didn't make much of my own clothing for that. I had two dresses that week that I had made that were 1940s dresses. I had the Regency kit that I loved. I had the brown woolen jacket that came from Primark that I'm still wearing because that yeah. was the that was the garment that made me go, well, this goes with everything. It looks Victorian, it looks 1930s, it, it looks fine over jeans. It was a a garment I found in a Primark. I've never seen anybody else wearing it. I've never seen another one in another shop. And I looked after that first year of finding it thinking this is really nice. And I've still got it. It's surprisingly well made and quite nice fabric actually. And I'm going to keep it for as long as I can. But that was, so I wasn't wearing vintage clothes. I wasn't wearing stuff I'd made, especially. I just put things together that, that worked. I mean, admittedly, it was all brown and cream as well. Once I've got yeah. over the goth bit, it's just, you know, if all your clothes match, then it all works together. Well, that's one way to begin, isn't it? You've got a colour palette that you like, so you can get things together that all go together. Um, and it's important to say as well, it's not like you've got to make everything right from the outset. You pull stuff together and make a mishmash. Things might be things that you've bought, like you might have an Edwardian blouse that I, I have... I love, um, I love performing that trick of buying things that look like I made them. Yeah. <laughs> and people ask me, oh, did you make that? Oh, well, actually, no. Um, but you can fill in the gaps before you get to a point where you've just made everything. All the, you know, it's the big job to make your whole wardrobe. So it's to huge. start off with, you do kind of mix and match and buy things that look like you made them and secondhand or whatever it is and just start to put things together that work together. 
and yeah. just a little piece here and there at a time. And there's nothing wrong with having a small wardrobe. I should yeah. say. I'm actually, I've written a full video around wardrobe stuff, but I mean, when you think about it historically, when people were making their own clothes or being hands down clothes and buying stuff secondhand, nobody had the kinds of extensive, like you see on Mary Kondo where like they pile up the clothes on the bed and oh, stuff. Oh. oh my God, that's mind bending to me because I've always Make kept it very, very small because as your style sort of evolves, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a trading game. Like, hey, I don't wear this anymore. My sibling doesn't wear this jacket anymore. I'm gonna take it because I want to experiment with it. Okay, this isn't really quite my style anymore. It's a bit too polyester for me now. I'm gonna give it to this person who potentially will want to experiment with this style now. So I think there's a whole sort of trading game of clothing that's sort of missing. Anyway, this is like going down a different tangent, but the point is when you make your own clothes, Clothes are time consuming to make and and or they should not cost what they cost today if we are to pay the people who make our clothes fair wages, which this is a whole different rabbit hole, but we're not supposed to have these massive wardrobes and I don't understand why there's a pressure to do so. Like there's no shame in wearing stuff time and time and time again. You see me wear the blouse. Look. You know, mm -hmm. even if it's some modern stuff, you know, I say to people, you know, oh I love what you do. No, no, no. Take the principles of what I do. Um, in, in terms of the sustainability, in terms of a few signature pieces, but you know, if you spend, if you spend nice, some, you know, some money on something nice that you enjoy, you'll wear it more. Therefore, you get it as a cost per wear basis. Yeah. And when you, um, and when you know, so, so for example, my grey top hat that, that, that you see, God, I've had that for ever. It seems bought it for two hundred fifty quid, and I was like, oh my God, this is like the most expensive thing I've ever bought. But I have worn it everywhere so cost per wear basis it's outlived several of my brother's trainers um you know so so it's that sort of thing um you know and 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 then if you get a few pieces that are, you like in your wardrobe and you start wearing them more and you get seen with them it then becomes your style and your look and then people will comment saying you've got such a nice style you look really put together that's because you've curated what yeah. you're wearing doesn't yeah. mean you have to do it when, you know, all the time and look beautifully turned out or wearing those pieces all the time. You can have days where, where you know, you don't feel like putting on those signature pieces or, you know, but also if you only have signature pieces, you can still feel crap, but just look fantastic. Mm -hmm. I can walk around, you know, well, when I could go out and everything, you know, I could walk around town, be massively hung over and get complimented for what I'm wearing. So, you know, people, mm -hmm. people just don't know. <laughs> You Wait, know. so I do this volunteer work in the evenings, again, when the world's a thing, but yeah. I have to like hold a bucket and collect some money after the Broadway show is let out. I'm in my pajamas half the time. It's like 1030 at night. I'll put on my long black Victorian coat that you've seen on my channel, maybe. And people are like- I've seen you over a sofa. Exactly. Well, exactly. Did you, did you, did you come from the opera? You look so pot. Where did you just come? No, I was just in bed half an hour ago and I just put on my- Body slippers poking at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a look. That's a look. Yeah. It needs to be a look. Yeah. Sleep so, where she. So it is about putting it together over time. Do you want to hear a bit about my story too? Yes, of course. Um, I, well, I found a couple of photos too. Um, particularly, I mean, this isn't necessarily relevant, but just for fun. I always had a bit of sass. <laughs> That's my granddad's saying that. Um, so I also went to I went to a girl's school where we had a uniform. And again, like you both talked about, we had a mufti day where you bring money to charity for one day a term and you get to wear what you want. So I can remember a day early on um, when the big, big movie that everybody went to see a million times when I was 12 was Back to the Future. So I tried to cosplay Marty McFly and I really wanted to just dress like, but, I had really strict wardrobe regulations at home. My parents were quite conservative. I wasn't allowed to wear jeans. I wasn't allowed to own jeans. I wasn't allowed to have my So I didn't have a pair of jeans, but I did have a pair of blue cotton trousers. I didn't have the red t-shirt, but I had a blue one. So I did as close as I could. But I remember already that sense of wanting to play with clothes. And yeah. later on, I was also bullied um you know growing up queer in a girls school that's you know 
that's going to go down like a lead balloon. So yep. I had this moment when I was getting bullied. I was so sort of angry, but turning it inward, that I had this mufti day where for, I, I don't even know why, but I put together this outfit over weeks and weeks. I crocheted a shawl. I was all in, I, was, I fully goffed out for one day of my life. And it was like an outward expression of feeling angry and powerless and afraid. And I couldn't even, I, it just was no question, there was no conscious decision to do it. I just had to do it. And I got to school that day and I never even realized what was gonna happen because of course it got even worse. There were cartoons of me on the notice board in the classroom, but it was kind of what I needed to do. So there was a sense of, I can express myself through dress. Um, so from that, going into, um, going into university and beyond that, I went and uh, started um, going backwards and forwards to New England. I had a girlfriend in Vermont and discovered vintage clothing. So I started wearing all sorts of bizarre things I was finding in, in vintage clothing shops like these. I think these check trousers came from with, with suspenders. I think they came from theater or something. It looked ridiculous, but it was just playing with stuff. And then this was my first real vintage dress. I bought the 20s dress, which I just loved. So again, you see this theme of playing with clothing. This is a more normal one, but even in normal clothes, I wasn't dressing like everybody else. So there's a sense of being a bit different already and feeling like, well, why not? Why not try things? Um, I've, got a, I've got a picture to share on the computer as well. This is when I really started getting into vintage stuff. And what a mishmash is this? This is like a fur hat. This is an Ike jacket, which is like army surplus from the fifties. Oh yeah. White trousers. <laughs> and this is in the woods in Vermont. So, That's, I love it. It was kind That's of developing. Cool. There yeah, was something yeah. happening there. I yeah. just, it, it's kind of put together, isn't it? It, It's a flower blooming, you know, you, 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 you yeah. see it and sort of go, oh, oh, what is it? And then you turn around the sort of next day and it's bloomed and it's like, oh, it's a multicolored tulip. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so, so you get again, this sense of, I was experimenting and there wasn't really any theme or look or branding to it. It's playing with clothes. It's like playing dress up as a way of life. So that, well, I mean, you reminded me of a couple of your stories. There was about, um, you were talking about the rockabilly crowd, Constance. Yeah. I had a period where I was, in the rock society at, at university. It's very off-brand for me to talk about how much I like 80s hair rock. Um, but at university, I would go to all these rock sock events. And of course, everybody there was in black band t-shirts and black jeans with long greasy ponytails drinking Nuki Brown. And because everybody else was in black, well, obviously I had to go all in white. So every time I would go all in white just for the say so, just to be contrary. So that was my thing. And I just would play with things. Yes, oh my God, somebody in the chat, Alicia Eve says, Kathy, did you go to Who is Sylvia in Woodstock, Vermont? That is a, the most amazing vintage shop. I remember it distinctly because it was a shop where you went into this old building and it was like rooms within rooms within rooms and up the stairs and round the corner. You just discover whole new rooms of stuff. They had boxes of lace. It was like anything in this box, ten dollars. Anything in this box, five dollars. And um, you could just pull stuff out and explore. And I had an experience in that shop. Actually, I thought about this the other night. They had a whole rack. This is 1998-ish. They had a whole rack one day of Victorian dresses on hangers, as if they were just for sale to wear. And I was. I had never had any concept that you could buy a Victorian dress in a shop. I had no concept of auctions or anything. I just, it blew my mind. And I remember having to go out of the shop with my then girlfriend and sit on the curb on the street outside, just crying because I couldn't get over just the wonder of seeing Victorian dresses on a rack like that and I could buy them. And they were all beyond my, you know, beyond my means of 
of them. But just the thought that I could was just unbelievable to me. So it's always been a fascination with clothes and with playing with clothes. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's always been something I've wanted to do differently. I, I always loved Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movies and was like, now, where are her clothes coming from? Because, you know, as a teenager, I'm looking at that and going, she didn't buy that at Marks and Spencer's. Where, where, do, you know, first getting the concept that people's clothes were different back then. And I like those clothes and not these clothes. And how do I do that? So there's always been this sense of there's, there's something else going on. I learned to sew at 18 and was making ball gowns. And it was always, though, wanting to move towards wearing these clothes. And I got involved in costuming and in the online costuming community 2003. But it still was about the events and the balls mm -hmm. and the dressing up for the Costume College Gala. So I ended up with this wardrobe full of fabulous gowns. And then just in the last two years started going, hang on, why is all my work in this cupboard and not on my body? Why am I still in jeans? So. Wear it to Tesco. Wear it to Tesco. Exactly. Tesco. <laughs> I'm loving so the flight. Wear that, that oak leaf dress. To oh. Tesco. Yeah. I remember there was a, there was a sketch in the show, I think it was Smack the Pony one time, with this woman walking around oh, yes. a supermarket in a wedding dress. Yeah. Glorious. So, do you really so, know how much I need this? I'm going to work as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this costs a lot of money. <laughs> so, but that's, that's the point is that, like, you know, you might as well spend your money on clothes that you're actually going to wear. You know, like, yeah. we're willing to spend money on a bridal gown that's like yeah. terribly expensive, but like, they're not, well, I guess sometimes now they are mass produced. But oh, yeah. Yeah. I really generally, are. They're one-off things. This is your special gown that you wear on this one day and you pay a fortune for it, but wouldn't it make more sense? Mm. And you don't pay a fortune for your everyday clothes, but to pay a little more for your everyday clothes. Mm. I mean, and, and, and the reason you don't pay for your everyday clothes is because the system is terrible. But, um, but, but also interestingly, historically, um, one thing that, you know, this whole idea of recycling and wearing clothes over and over, um, it was a thing in New York society, um, and I think it came um, from something that happened in London society as well. But in the season, you know, the, the London season, after London or New York season, after you were married, you would go to the balls, um, to the opera, ballet, etc., etc., theatre, um, wearing your wedding dress. But but it could have been yeah. altered and changed the style and whatnot. And then there are even accounts of the, the dress is being taken apart and the silk thing being over dyed and then you've then got a new dress right so but because if you think well it's white you can do other things to it and um, plus historically speaking white dresses were only for sort of the upper class and things like that because it showed wealth it showed all this sort of stuff um and and most people they just wear their nicest dress that they had or they'd buy a dress which was for best which they just were over and over again, but I've gone down a tangent, but yeah. Yeah. You know, so buy a wedding dress more often is basically what I'm saying. Yes. Um, I, yeah. We need more wedding dresses on the streets so. of... Yeah, <laughs> everywhere. Like that, you know, it would bring a whole new meaning to, oh, I've got to just get my train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's bring this up to date. So in terms of wearing these clothes, there are a lot of people watching who think, well, I could never wear this out because what would people say? So can you tell us what is it actually like when you wear this stuff out? Hold Can't on, I have to like off? backtrack my brain into that, that weird parallel universe where we are allowed to go out and yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What do people say? They say nothing. There are no people. The there are no are people. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I've been making a point of going to the grocery store once a week, dressed to the nines with my mask and making a point of dressing up. And there are people in Sainsbury's now, that there are members of staff at Sainsbury's who are like, I always wait for you to come in because you just make my day. It's just lovely. It seems to cheer people up sometimes. 
<laughs> Wait, yeah. promo, promo time. <laughs> oh, well, no, not quite. It's just like, yes, it's great. Yes, we should do no, this. So, wearing so, so, so. Wear a mask, America. Wear a mask. Are you, wait, are you um, selling them still? Um, so, so I've currently run out of stock of these ones, um, but I am going to be making more and I'm going to be posting those with like. Oh, I think his connection's not so great. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just fun, I suppose. Yeah. You know, so, so we're making more. Excellent. But, but that masks. I know, right? <laughs> well, no, it, it's just you see so many of them and they're just so boring and um, so so i decided to do that um but but it took me like well as i was saying earlier it took me about two hours at the post office yesterday um just writing out customs labels to things you know so i've sent them to um the uk obviously uh germany france uh sweden the philippines and qatar so wow. that was really interesting no but um Anyway. Yeah, anyway. sorry, I can yeah. digress. So tell us about what happens when you go out dressed like this in real life. Is it is it like people, I mean, I think people have fears of what people are gonna say. So what is it really like? Zach, do you wanna Okay, go so, so when I first started to do this, luckily growing up in a, um, you know, liberal, um, you know, place like Brighton, it was fine, but well, it's okay. But people genuinely are just generally curious and going, oh, what's this about? You know, and just pleasant and interested. Um, people aren't as judgmental. You know, people aren't the villains that we might think they are in terms of that the public aren't scary, but they are terrifying. Uh, no, so <laughs> um, pe people are just generally lovely. 99.9% um, .9 of all people are just really lovely and quite intrigued and things like that. But now, you know, but but now I sort of go out and people go, oh, aren't you the guy from the BBC? And I'm like, yeah. But before then, it was this whole thing of, oh, you're going to a wedding or this or that. But I'd say that the majority of any comments that I get have always been incredibly positive. Um, because people like individualism. They like that whole thing of, you know, and once you confront them with the fact that oh, I'm doing it because I love it, it's like, uh, uh, okay, you know, you can't really have a problem with that but yeah. um you know and uh, as oscar wilde said you know um be yourself because everyone else is taken you know mm -hmm. so so it's that whole thing of just to to use a phrase from nike just do it <laughs> <laughs> just do okay it. so bernadette what do people do people say anything or do they react when you what the really at least not that i perceive because i think i've been dressing unusually for long enough that i'm just unfazed by it like i don't even hear it on mm. the street i know like i've been out with you sometimes and you'll you know sort of nudge me and be like did you did you hear that person made a comment about this this person just called you mary poppins this person just like said they liked your outfit and i was like oh I didn't even hear it because it's just like it's yeah. just you filter I'm things it's just, I'm well so it's just the way that i dress like these feel like my normal clothes so i don't subconsciously even fathom that they're talking to me mm. because why would they be why would they be saying that to just like my everyday clothes oh yeah because i guess this is a little bit out of the ordinary <laughs> but yeah. it also might be because I do live in New York City and, you know, have lived in I was going to say, large it's cities. between New York and London. Right. Because you spend a lot of time in Yeah. I don't... They're very, you know, in big cities you expect to see some unusual things. Mm -hmm. I do get a lot of, are you in a play? Mm -hmm. Are you in one of the shows? Especially when I worked near the theatre district, mm -hmm. you know. Are you in Mary Poppins? I'd have to like sigh and begrudgingly explain to them that going outside of the theater when you know is against union contracts when you're in costume but you know yeah no um it's weird and I realize this is not helpful at all because 
it oh, does yeah. take a lot of time to get to the point where you are so comfortable in your clothes that you don't even like hear people on the street talking to you. It's never been bad. I can't think of a single instance where someone has said something negative to my face or like behind my back about what I wear. Yeah. Well, I would, I would say in reply to a comment with that, that small towns tend to be a lot more judgmental, um, Kate Crest said. Um, I, I'm not sure, maybe, but I live in a small town that I would expect to be quite judgmental and it kind of depends where you go. I had to stand, I live in Mansfield in Nottinghamshire, um, which is not a very affluent town, probably quite a small town. Probably a lot of people here who never leave Mansfield and I had to stand in the street a few weeks ago outside the bank and queue two meters apart in a mask for like an hour. And all I got were people like looking like this and a woman, two, two people in front of me in the queue with her kid and the kid going, the kid looking at me and looking at me and the kids going, and the mother's going, go on, ask her then, ask her. Go on, ask her, you can ask her. And you know, you can ask her, is she Mary Poppins? And we went into this whole thing about was I Mary Poppins and why was I going to the bank? And this whole thing about, well, I need money for a new hat, you know? It's, <laughs> so it's lovely, so particularly the way that children react and the way that the parents want to create some magic for them. Um, and will say things like, they'll bring the kid to me and say, she wants to know, you know, why you're dressed to have. And you've got a great opportunity to say, well, how would you dress? If you could dress anything you want, if you could be anybody you wanted. So I find it a very positive experience. And even That's when really adults ask, so why are you dressed like this? When you say, well, this is just how I like to, you kind of see them go, oh, you can do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah it's like, oh, see oh, the oh, oh. Turning like, and going, wait a minute. You're an adult, you don't need permission, you know, or, or even growing up, you don't need permission. You know, it's that whole thing of, you know, when you're sort of old enough and you've got your own money, it's that whole thing of going, oh my God, I can just buy cake. There doesn't need to be a reason to buy cake. I can just buy cake. It's like, it's a bit like saying, you can wear a cape. You can do <laughs> these things. Because the thing is you need to give yourself permission. You don't need to seek permission. You know, because if you're, if, if because then you're relying on others to know who you are yeah. when you know who you are or you need to find out who you are. It is a it is a bit of a lonely journey in a way, but not lonely. It's more self-reflective and self-discovering as opposed to, you know, oh, no one likes that. Um, you know, it is, you know, but there are hard parts, but overall, you know, you can just do it, you know? Yeah. There is no magic wand where you can sort of go, wave this magic wand and suddenly you're able to do it and suddenly you're confident it's it's building it up and i think you'll probably find that most of the time the public the general world out there has got better things to do and just doesn't really care you know <laughs> so so as soon as you sort of realize that oh oh wait there's like other stuff going on and people don't really care people are sort of willing to just go oh fine then you realize that those worries and anxieties were all your own um, I mean, some of the time, you know, um, but but um, it it is difficult, but it, it, it is possible, you know, that, that, that yeah. there are all sorts of people that do it. So so when I say to people that are feeling sort of down or want to get into it, it's sort of just going, you know, you, you, you need to sort of stick to the path, you know, don't give up. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's important to say also that it isn't black and white that you're either fully decked out in the cape and the hat and everything, or not at all. I find yeah. that how much people comment depends on what I'm wearing. I've tried mm -hmm. to, my trip to the supermarket during lockdown, I've tried to start figuring out what it is about an outfit that makes people comment. And like changing different bits to see some days, everybody wants to talk to me. Other days, nobody, it's like, what what's the difference? And it seems like the hat. The hat. Is a big yes. Yeah. Hat. It's yeah. the hat. You know, if I stopped wearing a hat. People are much less yeah. likely mm. to come. I used to wear hats all the time, and I deliberately stopped wearing hats in public because I don't personally like attention, public attention. I don't like it when people come up to me for the way that I dress. 
now it's inevitable, but yeah, I like if, you know, I don't want to go to the bank knowing that there's going to be a child that's going to want to come up to me and have a conversation about Mary Poppins like that, that like freaks me out. So like, I don't do this. Like I do this for myself. I do this because this is what I wear and I'm physically uncomfortable in other clothing. But, you know, if people try and tell you that you do it for attention. Yeah. Not yeah. always the case. What I'm saying is you can yeah. tweak what you're yes. wearing. If you're not quite ready to have everybody ask you yes. questions yet. Yeah. Don't go for the hat. But if you're having a really Spot. confident day where you're up for it, wear the hat. You know, you can yeah. change from day to day. Slay. Slay and wear that hat. Yeah. yeah. You know, so be, being a guy dressing historically, mm -hmm. it's a case of always wearing a hat. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and you just sort of em embrace it. You sort of, through crowds and everything, you look sort of above people's faces. But, but because people will look at me and then you'll sort of meet their eye and then it's that whole thing of, oh. um, <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, it's that whole thing of, ah, another person. Um, so you sort of have to sort of, you know, or just smile at people, you know, which you can't really do with a mask. Um, but, but, you know, especially as with, with hat and mask, you're just like, with smiles. yeah, yeah, smiles. Um, <laughs> no, so, so we are currently limited in that regard. But you also put out, if you are walking around, you will therefore gain confidence. Yeah. You know, fake it till you make it. If you're like wandering and going, oh my God, oh my God. Because I still get that. I still get those times when I'm wearing if that's new and I haven't properly worn out yet um, or, 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 or like I've done something or whatever. Um, I'll feel a bit sort of like, oh my God. And you know, oh, will people like it? And it's, uh, but it doesn't matter. Um, you know, so it is that whole thing of just trying it. You know, you won't know until you try. Right, and the po the trick to it, I think, is doing like committing to it and doing it. Reg not committing like I have to be one hundred percent historically accurate right now, but just yeah. committing to the notion of wearing what you want to wear when you want to wear it. Because I feel like a lot of the apprehension that we get from ourselves and from others is when people sort of, especially the people that you're close to and that you see every day, family and friends and school folks and whoever you know work people who kind of look at you like oh you're trying this today you're trying a new thing you're doing something new and different and that makes you uncomfortable then like mm -hmm. oh yes I'm new I'm doing something new and different people don't know what to expect but when people know to expect you're doing weird stuff with your clothes every single day it just becomes you and they just look past it oh. and then yeah. when it gets to that point where you're not getting like public you don't have to overcome that barrier of like weirdness from the people that you encounter every single day then it becomes much more natural for you to just be yourself in your clothes, which makes you able to be more naturally yourself in your clothes in public. Yeah. 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 So, Constance, it, tell us about your experiences. Uh, mine have always been incredibly positive. Um, and it is a case of it's, it's, it's in your own head is the, is the fear. And once, and I do remember doing it and not fully committing and being, Oh gosh, don't, don't look at me. And you feel much more uncomfortable that way. It was so much better when I just just went for it and thought, no, I'm, I, I walk I walk a lot of places and I walk very fast. So it's sort of also, also that thing of, you know, leaving it all behind. It's okay, it's fine. <laughs> I do live in quite a small town. I also lived in Brighton for a while, which is, in, okay, so yeah, you, Brighton and London, you blend in anywhere, it doesn't matter. But I now live in quite a small town and I do occasionally joke that I think, I think I'm being a bit too weird for here today. So sometimes, sometimes the comments I get, but, but other times it's it's lovely. My one of my favourite interactions was buying a cup of coffee on the train station platform at home to go into London. And I bought a coffee and I did have a very large hat on with an Edwardian ensemble. And the and the chap serving me the coffee went, I'm so sorry I haven't got a, a, a more attractive cup to put your coffee in. It doesn't look at all right giving you this one. <laughs> and my aim in life is to find a travel travel drinks mug that does that does suit me. I've yet to find one. I've tried a few, not got there. Um, and I said to him, oh, yeah, that's, that's something I'm, I'm aiming for. One day I'll find the right one. And yeah, that was just really nice. And as I said, most of my interactions with people are like that. I do get asked a lot 
are you going to an event as we all do like whether it's weddings or plays but because there's quite a lot of the second world war reenactment stuff and there's that ble bleeding into the vintage scene if it's more 20th century that i look then as people do do say oh are you going to an event and i'm like no 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 i'm just just doing my shopping i'm not going anywhere um i know this is how i always look are you shopping an event are you going to events yes tesco yes. <laughs> <laughs> you get asked like you know are you going somewhere today and i i try and reply like whenever people do ask me those sorts of like yeah insinuating questions i try and reply in the most mundane way possible yeah, kind of personal. <laughs> get to the shops oh i just you know put this on this morning yeah, fine why are you wearing that and they're wearing like, when? jeans why yeah. are you wearing that <laughs> i think i think i noticed this last time i was with you two in london that three is more noticeable than two <laughs> two is always it could be a couple it's just some friends it's you know it's 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 two people three was a bit much it was quite interesting <laughs> It's and, a coat. <laughs> and you needed more clearance on stage, we discovered as well, didn't we? <laughs> yes, yes. We <laughs> needed a bit more clearance on the platform in the, on the sidewalk. Um, yeah, I was just thinking I had, a, I had an interesting experience last year, uh, at the beginning of the year, just before lockdown, when I was out for a day in Dublin with some friends of mine who are clinical psychologists of m many years' experience. And they got to watch for the first time me out in the wild they've seen me at events at business events but seeing yeah. me out in the wild and seeing the way people on the street react to me and it was a big day there were a lot of people and i was getting a little bit overwhelmed with all the so why are you dressed so what well, why 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 are you dressed you look oh and um my friend julie started to say to me from a psychologist point of view she said well why don't you turn the question back on them there are a lot of people here why did you come and Come and talk to me. Why did you come and ask? What what yep. what do you dress up for? What occasions in your life do you dress up for? I thought that was a really interesting way to look at it, to turn it back on them and say, why are you so interested? Mm. In a positive sort of way. And uh and what love doing that to you? being sassy. <laughs> I meant in a kind way, but yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. You know, you it it's it's really good at diffusing a situation. Not really diffusing it, but if someone asks a stupid question, because when people say there aren't stupid questions, oh, there are. Um, <laughs> definitely are. Um, and, and if you ask those sorts of questions, you should, you should definitely feel subconscious about it. Um, so, no, I'm joking. But, um, you know, so when someone asks a really stupid question, it's fun to sort of turn it round with humour so they can have a laugh, but understand the point. Um, you know, it's quite a sort of deaf thing you, you, you get. It's something you sort of mould into as with everything. You know, you know, you, it's almost like you don't know everything straight away. It's like you don't start dressing the way straight away. So you build up these skills over time. Um, so then you become a dab hand at it and you've got your one liners to sort of turn people around. It's like, why are you dressing like that? It's like, why are you dressing like that? Or, you know, um, you know it's like, oh, I wouldn't wear that. I wouldn't wear that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so as soon as you turn it on its head and and make people sort of question themselves or sort of go, oh wait, mm. or when people ask really invasive weird questions, it's going, sorry, what gives you the right to do that? Or when people come up and just touch me, or try and take my hat, or what do you um, wear for underwear? You know, oh, can I try your hat on? Oh, the underwear question. Get it all the time. All the time. <laughs> oh, all right. You know, it's like, oh, underwear do you wear? And it's like, well, you're clearly never now finding out. Um, <laughs> you know, you know that it, it's it's an interesting one. Um, but yeah, you know, and 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 yeah, I could sort of say one thing or another. But but in fact, I like at this point that it's a massive mystery um, to to all and sundry. So so I think that's also quite fun. You know, keep keeping some sort of mystery alive, but also. It's just inappropriate to ask someone about their underwear, whether yeah. it's historical or not. It's like, if you if you ask me what underwear did they wear during the period, I can be like, cool, I can tell you about that. I've done various posts on it. You ask me directly what underwear I'm wearing, that is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't ask anyone else on the street, okay, that person might, but you know, you, you wouldn't ask someone, and you'd feel really uncomfortable maybe asking a woman of the same age as me or whatever, saying, "What underwear are you wearing?" It becomes a personal invasive question, um, 
and it's just people understanding manners. Um, and as soon as you turn it around and go, that's a rude thing, they go, oh, oh, crumbs. That is a really, like, thing I shouldn't have done. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's cool. So they learned the lesson. There was a bit of humour involved, but they know that, you know, it, it's like the thing at the moment about cosplay isn't consent and costume isn't consent. There is a real problem with that. Um, I was actually, so I was actually at an event once um, and this, this woman uh, started to go, oh, is that a pocket? With my full front Regency trousers. And I was like, no, 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 no. that is, that is, no, no that's it's really open. <laughs> it's like, no, no, okay. <laughs> um, so, so um, she, you know, flushed right, bright red and I sort of went like, it has the same effect of if a man had done that to a woman in costume, which often happens, um, there'd be uproar and everything, and you know, but but folks are the guy it's sort of oh it's funny, it's like no, but that's still something you just don't do. Um, but they're such rare an occurrence, it's absolutely fine, you know, I'm used to sort of sh shrugging those sorts of things off. Um, but yeah, I think as a general rule, if people sort of just treat people nicely, then then everything's everything's gravy. I think that's a rare occurrence. I've had people Very. Want to talk to me, want to talk to me and sort of, they've got the hand on my arm and it's like, you know, I kind of want to step back, but very rarely, I think that's happened maybe mm. I find I'm actually like, like interacted with like that less in historical dress. People feel like they have to be very uptight and very yeah. you know, modest and official and polite. <laughs> <laughs> it's my lady. You know, whereas I'm like, I'm, I, I speak memes, I promise, like I'm just as 21st century, like you know, we're, we're still dwellers of the 21st century, but I kind of do appreciate being at least initially spoken to a little bit more like politely and like, you know, I never it's get called on the street anymore and it's great. <laughs> I mean, I've been upgraded on airlines because it's that whole thing of, oh yeah, please do. And I'm just like, oh my God. But, but, but it's like, yeah, we, you know, just because we like the aesthetic doesn't mean we're completely disconnected. You know, I've, um, you know, I'm currently watching, just started watching um, the new series of Umbrella Academy on Netflix because it's just like, love it. Um, finished now all the anime series that I like. Um, and it's the whole thing of, yeah, why not? You know, and, you know, so, so one thing I've started to do a bit um, occasionally, it's sort of like, oh, I love it. Why did you make it? Yas. Um, you know, but, but, <laughs> it's like, yas. Um, you know, and then it's also allowing people some sort of avenue into it. Because if you go, oh, because you're wearing that, you must feel this certain way about things. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but because that's a whole thing um, which, which I was very adamant with and we all were, um, with, with the whole sort of um, movement of Black Lives Matter and everything, talking about the fact that despite the fact we wear old clothes and stuff, you know, Dandy Wellington sums up great. I've got his badge somewhere. Um, vintage style, not vintage values. Mm -hmm. You know, just because we dress in a certain way doesn't mean you have to have the ideas of people of the time or that, That's you know. Good. Not everyone of the time was of those beliefs. It's just the people that we read about in history books, which is an entirely biased set of... Yeah narrative in and of itself but there were people in history who were fighting for women's rights who were fighting for anti-slavery who were fighting yep. for yep. all yep. the rights that we are still fighting for today and they wore the same clothes that the enslavers wore because that was what it what was like that was clothing exactly like, and they like to turn it on its head and say oh so if you're wearing a modern business suit does that mean that you are um you know pro-Trump, pro-oil um, lobbies, pro this, pro that. And it's like, no, it's like, oh, you're wearing a modern polyester sweater. Does that mean you're um, for child slave labor? Um, it's just like, oh, so you're for the use of um, fossil fuels and fabrics, which will um, outlast us all, I see. Mm. No, that's mm. just not how it works. Oh, you're wearing a cotton t-shirt. You must hate people having water. Um, <laughs> you know, it, and you sort of go, no, no period in history and no society is clean. Mm. There is something wrong at every point in history. It's just that nowadays we have access to all the information of our past and we can't really look at our present with a retrospective analysis yet. So people will be going, they drove cars, they ate meat, they 
you know, they had a pandemic and people didn't take it seriously. You know, people are going to look back and go, oh, you know, and it's like what people were gunned down the street because of the color of their skin, they say, talking to an alien, you know, so <laughs> it, it's all about, you know, society's moved on. That's great. People say, um, you know, uh, as in, um, um, uh, as in one of the YouTube videos, you know, um, saying that, you know, you, you must have the sort of same ideals and stuff. And it's sort of like, no, no, you know, so I think it's important to differentiate, you know, and I've, completely forgotten where I was going with that. There was a point I was going to make, but I sort of got lost in my rambling tent. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> it was a formed idea. Uh, I think in terms of confidence, one of the things I believe, I'm going to close this window, it's a background noise, um, about having the confidence to go out and do this, I think that maybe what gives you confidence to do something is having a strong enough sense of why you're doing it. If you've got a strong enough why, you'll overcome all sorts of obstacles, whether it's people around you at school or around you in the street or your family. It's having a strong enough why will give you the strength to do anything. Exactly. So, And it's not just unique to dressing. Exactly. It's in every aspect. You know, it's so starting a YouTube if... channel, it's starting a business. It's, you need that strong why. So what is your why? in terms of dressing this way, each of you. Constance, tell us, do you have an idea why you do this? Um, I... And sometimes the why is so much part of you that it's kind of hard to articulate. It is, I was thinking about one of the other things that changed my dressing, because obviously I talked about you know, being more into 40s and vintage and then going backwards into, well, I now say that I sort of often say I dress as the unfashionable woman of the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And I'm very aware with the anniversary of the, um, well, with, with the suffragettes fighting for women's rights to vote from uh, you know, 2009 onwards, there were various small things being marked in history. There was the large amount of stuff being marked, you know, in our time about the anniversary of the First World War and the Second World, well, the start of the First World War. I started reading quite a lot about the women of that era and what they, they stepped up to do in that time. I read quite a lot of diaries of women. And I just became aware that these women were, number one, fighting for the right to vote. And then they stepped up to do all the jobs that the men couldn't do or even went to France and did the same jobs the men were doing in that era. And they had so much freedom and so much that they had to do. And their clothes changed because of it. And then the 20s came along. And yes, some people go, oh, yes, the flappers, gay abandon, off we go. But a lot of those women just sat back and went, well, I want to carry on like this. And the world went, no, you've got to go back to yeah. where you were. And there were a lot of women left in an odd situation and I find them really inspiring. And, you know, a lot of what they fought for and wanted, as we've, as we've sort of touched on, is still stuff we're having to fight for or mention or point out. And yeah, that, it was that time of year here, it, for, for us, sort of made me look at those people of the past. And I just think, well, they, oh yeah, I, I, want, I want to do what they did. And, and, but in the, in the best possible way and applying it now so that everyone is everyone is treated fairly not just you know not just the women but everyone is that yeah, one of the things that 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 pushed me into going more than it more than just being oh i like vintage clothes it was no uh, uh, i like i don't know you want to you remember those women and from that realize what we're capable of now yeah we're capable of changing the world now that's incredible yeah so, Bernadette, what's your why? My why now is because I am vehemently opposed to fast fashion. Like mm -hmm. I have, like it is now my rule in life is that I do not buy clothing unless I can verify that it is ethically produced, which eliminates the majority of clothing shopping options. Mm -hmm. So what I buy now either has to be ethically produced custom made which is rare because that's expensive but um or made by myself so that's kind of like I've, I've set myself like rules of like how i obtain clothing and then furthermore it has to fit into my aesthetic mm -hmm. so why i do it is because i want to have a wardrobe that i feel good in and feel good about mm -hmm. those are like my criteria 
And of course, like, yeah. it's such a small part of the pie because unethical and harmful production is just, it's, it's in everything that we do nowadays. But the clothing is something that I've studied. It's a big part of my life. It's my job now. Um, it's obviously a big part of my identity. And that's kind of what I want you know, it's, it's a good focus for me to at least start with. Yes. I think the natural, the message naturally comes out. If you've got a problem with fast fashion and that's what you're focusing on, anybody watching you and influencing, being influenced by you will also say, oh, she's got a point. And, huh, where did this come from? Where did that come from? Where did they start to question the whole of their lives? So you can tell that story through one aspect, which is the clothing. That's a great, that's a great one. Zach? I'm glad I sort of came further along because I'm just like, why? Why? Oh, um, oh, but because I wouldn't be me. I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be Zach. I wouldn't be comfortable. I wouldn't be happy. You know, I, my, my why is that I just, I know it seems quite flippant, but I just love it with an extreme passion and joy you know that that fact that especially with men's clothing now nowadays it's so infinitely boring mm -hmm. and just so crap that there's nothing i find very irredeemable in it and it's just like life's far too short to wear boring clothes not in you know if you don't like the clothes that you're wearing you're sort of missing the point because clothes are something you have to wear, unless you're part of a nudist colony, then, you know, you you might as well enjoy wearing them. Mm -hmm. You know, at, rather than being forced into, you know, you hear it all the time, you know, especially having two older sisters, it's that whole thing of, oh, I bought this, doesn't quite fit here, doesn't quite fit there, oh, I'm not happy with the fit, or oh, I can't wear that at this time of the month because of this and that. And it becomes this whole thing of, you know, clothes, not quite being you and if clothes can help you be a more authentic yourself then do it you know and and i also appreciate the fact that it slows things down and that's something i think people are really appreciating at the moment in lockdown as well that whole thing that it's okay for things to slow down and to take stock and it's the same with when I make things, you know, it's the research that goes into it um, and everything. And the process as well is something I massively enjoy, the research as well. Um, and I think the why is just, I'm not ready to stop yet either, you know? Yes. People say, you know, oh, will you carry on doing this? And it's sort of going, yeah, I'm going to be that weird person in in it in like, you know, the old people's home that, that sort of, you know, who's that guy? It's like, oh, he, he's like 300 years old, just leave him be, you know. <laughs> I, I want to be able to look, I want to look, I want to be able to look back at my life and go, I did what made me happy. Um, and I was happy in myself. Um, and know that through that, it then, will help influence people that I talk to and I interact with. Because if you're yourself, you're then honest with who you're interacting with. You're not trying to be someone else. So that's why when people meet me and stuff, you know, people go, oh, thanks. And, you know, because I'm not trying to hide anything. You know, I'm just myself. What you see is what you get. And I think that's the why to just be true to myself because after all, just in the closet for so long that it's that thing of, you know, I had all that growing up and all those experiences I couldn't yeah. have, which now, why not, you know, mm -hmm. why not? The why is why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good why to have. And for me, the why has, your why develops over time, I think. I started doing this for the same reason. It was a, an exploration of my identity. Who am I? How do I be authentic? But nowadays, my why is more about become more about the people who follow us and setting an example because now that I have that PO box address and I have people writing to me I have kids in high school writing to me saying one day I feel like I might want to do this and I have I get letters that make me cry about 
I'm a weird kid too. And this is something I, I won a business award last year, as you know, and my speech on stage, I had to make a speech about my business and why I do what I do. And so I spent three days trying to crystallize why I do what I do. And it came down to when I was at school, I was bullied like crazy, felt like the odd one out and grew beyond it and realized, oh, wow, this is actually kind of the best thing that ever happened to me because it allowed, it gave me the freedom not to care anymore what people think. And then they gave me a complete freedom to invent who I want to be and create a very unusual life and not fit in. And now I get to pay that forward and say, and to look at younger people who may be in the same situation I was in and say, it's okay, this too shall pass. And you're going to be able to become yourself so much better because you've been through this. This is gonna make you. Um, so I feel like I want to be there to show other people what they can be and to show other people how they can create themselves as well and be intentional about who they're gonna be in the world and create a more interesting world. Does that make sense? Yes. Certainly does. Everybody's yeah. Wet. It's very um, hard. We all need. Thank you. So, we are now an hour and a half in. Uh, do we have any uh, further things we haven't said? I'm going to go some questions, I think, in a minute. Anything <laughs> say anything before we go to the questions? You want to start putting questions in the chat if you have them? And we'll answer a few of them. I know we had a question earlier, but I think I would like to ask Zach in particular, which was someone saying, um, I'm in high school right now. I know how I want to dress, but when I dress how I want to dress at school, people bully the heck out of me. So it makes me want to stop. So how do yeah. I get so, that? What do I do? There is no um, one solution. There is, you know, so I had a really, really difficult time. Uh, you no. Know, being at a boarding school and then coming out and then all that sort of stuff and oh, conversations for other times, but it's um, uh, it's not easy. And I think a good way to sort of deal with that is know know that you know yourself. You have a better understanding of yourself than those bullies do. You know they they're probably still struggling with who the hell they are. You know, one one of my biggest bullies from school, you know, came out as gay last year. <laughs> you know, so so it's that whole thing of there are reasons why people bully, mainly because people bully because they're afraid. They see you being yourself and confident and want that for themselves in some degree and they can't have it. You're doing what they wish yeah. they could do in terms of self-expression and understanding. There are going to be days where it's going to look very bleak outside and you're just not going to like it. But if you forge through, that's one of the hardest things. If you double down in spite of what people are saying to you and, and, and what they might be doing, it will give you more confidence and you will be able to, you know, standing up is a powerful thing to do, but standing up for yourself is probably the most important thing. And by continuing to do exactly what they hate is going to be your best attack defense strategy. Um, you know, so, so it came to my end of year prom and the table arrangements were out and, um, uh, you know, and you got to put in forms about who you want to sit next to or whatnot. And, it was, and then I was on a table with a few other misfits as it were, or people where it was just an overflow and we sort of got an okay, but, and then there up on the notice board was in Sharpie, big letters, loser table. And I was like, that really, really hurt. But I'm not a loser now. You, I was never a loser. Um, you know, and, and that's the thing. If, if the worst thing they can do um, is belittle what you wear, then they're really not thinking. 
um you know that the, people it's just try and attack you and people try and tear you down because they feel threatened by something that you're doing if you yeah. persist in doing it all you're gonna do i don't want to say like harm them in return because you don't want to deliberately harm people they're kind of harming themselves by starting all this in the first place but by continuing to do what what you do best you're ultimately going to succeed more in life because you're doing something that challenges what yeah. people do. You take some of that power by you turning have, it around. Yeah, you have the potential to gain more attention, mm. which is what they don't like. And I'm personally, I'm personally a huge fan of taking what people throw at me and adopting that, like owning yeah. that. Obviously this, this can be difficult if it's like something that's actually really harmful or triggering. But, you know, I'm no stranger to hate, especially, you know, it doesn't, I know I'm supposed to say it gets better, but if, if you, if you get public in any way, it doesn't get better. You just get better at dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm going to use the word pretentious, for example, people throw that around, you know, trying to insult me. I use that word. Like, I, fine, I'm pretentious. I don't care. You write pretentious in big Sharpie letters over a table where I'm supposed to be sitting. Welcome to the pretentious table. We're the cool kids now. Yeah. Would you have some champagne at the pretentious table? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> happy over here and that's all that matters. Whatever you exactly. want. You know, people, you know, there's now a section that starts to call me a narcissist and I'm sort of like, like friends of mine and people that know me are like, nah. It, it, it's that whole thing of there will, there will always be bullies out there. No matter what you do, where you go, there will all, you can't, you're not chocolate. Everyone can't love you, you know? And you need, yeah. there's always going to be someone that's got a problem with you. And after all, if you're not someone that the church would have burned 500 years ago, are you really living your life? <laughs> <laughs> I need that like on a placard on my wall. Yeah, yeah I should get that printed on a t shirt that I'll never wear. <laughs> No, <laughs> that's fashion. Sash. The sash is always the answer for things you want to display. Yeah. Go to a person who can't carry a banner all day, write it on a sash. It's a very portable yeah. way of demonstrating. I love that, portable demonstration. <laughs> Do your arms get tired when you hold up signs? Here's the, <laughs> you know. Are you tired of being tear gassed at your local protests? Wear a sash. <laughs> that won't really do anything. No, it won't. It'll look fashionable though. Yes. So, um, I mean, we should also add that if you're being, if you're at school and you're being bullied, you need to find also an advocate, tell somebody about yep. it, don't suffer in silence. Um, you need people on your side. So start building your team and yep. understand that there are always gonna be people who don't agree with you. I mean, we say this even now in, in my business world, that the best thing for you is not to try to make everybody like you. Even when you're starting a business, um, I have a, a mentor called Stu who always says, love me or hate me, there's no money in the middle. And he encourages people to do to be themselves so that you find the people, you don't just find people who kind of like you. In order to find the people who really love you, you're going to be finding people who really hate you as well. So be yourself so you can find your people. And I would also maybe suggest that if you're young and you're dealing with a lot of this stuff, young people and teenagers can be like ridiculously irrational and stupid because they're also trying to figure themselves out. They don't get themselves and therefore they're trying to attack anything and anyone. Anyway, they're basically just confused. So what I would, if you're anything probably like any of us, your mind is a little bit different. You're a little bit, I hate the word old soul, but you're kind of in that like old soul. You've got a different level of maturity if you are feeling these urges to be different and to embrace yourself and your own mm. aesthetic and lifestyle desires and you know do your own thing and express your own self. You're probably already ahead of these people. I would say, I personally have always gotten along much better with people much older than myself. Don't be afraid to look for friendship in people who are older than you and people who can mentor you. Because those are the people, if you were in my talk yesterday afternoon, the people who mentor you 
are the people who ultimately pull you up into wild strata of success. And they're not going to be, you know, because they have more life experience. They understand themselves better. They're going to understand you so much better. Not to say all young people are just confused and dumpster fires, but like if the people that you're struggling with are all of your same age group, don't be afraid to look elsewhere. Yeah. And they're all struggling just like you. They're all insecure. And, you know, the girl who bullied me most in high school, um, it was when I was starting to show signs of having crushes on other girls. Years later, somebody said she'd seen her. Oh, yeah, they said, I think she has a girlfriend now. Yeah. She was bullying me because she was resisting what she didn't like in herself. So, you know, there's stuff going on in their head, and it may be that you're triggering something in them. So it's not about you. So moving on from that question, I have another one. Um, we haven't talked about putting yourself out there on the internet, whether on Instagram, on YouTube, any advice for people wanting to start a channel, start being out there on the internet and are a little bit afraid to make that first step? Do it for yourself and do it because you have a passion and do it because you have something to share, but don't do it because you want a public following. 100,000% yeah. do not because you are just setting yourself up for epic disaster and a whole lot of mental health issues. And be authentic, you know? So so unless you're doing like a, a channel or, or putting up a thing that is a parody or something, don't try and be someone you're not. You will get um, people um people will enjoy you and love you more for just genuinely being yourself and because they've come to see you because you're saying you're yourself and they want to see that reflected you know that's why when people say you know oh stay out call it, stay out that's like no, no 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 i'm a real person i'm going to tell you how it is and be authentic and stay to it you know um and well when you, you know, have this sort of theme this you you have your content your, your historical dress your historicals if you have a purpose for being on the internet people don't attack you as a person as quickly. But if you're just mm -hmm. like, hey, what's up, you guys? It's me. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to my Instagram page. Look at me all the time. People start attacking you as a human. And that's really, really harmful. I try, yeah. you know, I try and pull myself out of my work as much as possible. The channel, my internet presence is about the historical dress. It's about inspiring people. It's about doing stuff for you. It's about showing you stuff. So that myself, my like actual human existence can hopefully stay unscathed as long as possible because that's what causes burnout and that's what causes a whole lot of all these internet mental health related issues. Yeah. On a related note, my channel, you might have noticed, isn't about me either. My approach to it has been very much my approach to business and what I've learned about having a successful business is not about what have I got to sell? I can sell you who's going to buy it. It's about my YouTube channel and my business is about you. It's about your needs, more of my videos about what's going on with you. My whole way of coming up with ideas is about listening to what people are telling me. So mm. I've made a channel that's about you and not about me. So that means that I'm protected myself a bit more and I'm doing something that's a service, not saying everybody look at me and, you know, inviting criticism, you know. Mm. So go out there and do it in order to be useful to somebody else, yeah. I would say. And, but with saying that, it doesn't mean that you can't occasionally go look at me because this is the internet yeah. and it is all that. But, but as long as that isn't your prime mover, as long as that isn't the pillar that holds you up, um, you know, then you're fine. You know, it, it's... And you're back to the it, why, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it's all interconnected because it's quite literally people and people are interconnected. And just, that's just how these things do it. You know, so 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 after the clip that went viral and everything, I had so many opportunities to become a celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, I was offered to go on game shows, on news things, on all of this. And I was going, no, the content that is out there is exactly what I want, I say over it, no problem. Um, and I just wanted to be straightforward with it all and was sort of going, no, I'm good. I'm happy here sewing. And I just carried on doing what I was doing. I didn't do that whole thing of, oh great, I've done this now. I'm then going to become a 50 minutes of fame baseless thing. And it's sort of like, no, 
generally myself oh cool people loved it great i've got a waistcoat to finish mm -hmm. you know it it's it you know and if you do come across the 50 minutes of fame you have to be really careful with how you use it um you know use it to promote yourself a bit you know if that helps your business or helps an identity thing or helps a cause great but but don't let the world of social media or the world of media or the world of publicity take advantage of that thing that makes you uniquely you and try and do something against it or to change it or to point at it and make it funny don't, don't change what you're doing because as uh, the further you move away from authenticity the further away you fall from success and longevity mm -hmm. You move away from relatability, which nowadays is supremely important. Yeah. To engaging an audience that actually supports you as a human and not like as an entity. Yeah. And therefore becomes fictionalized and therefore becomes more of a target for hate and cancel culture. Yeah. Because we can cancel fiction. It doesn't exist. It's not a real human. Mm. Yes. Yes. So... Uh, I think we're getting towards time. We ought to wrap this up. So, uh, do we have any final words, any final sort of pep talk for those people out there who try, perhaps look to us as something they want to, to be or to do one day? When people say, I want to be like you. Great idea. Thanks. Don't be like me, be like yourself. You know, don't aspire to be someone else. You can aspire to have certain traits or like, I wish, you know, I could deal with situations like such and such. Those are things that you learn, but never say, well, never put that pressure on yourself to be like someone else or to be someone else, because then you'll never find out who you are. Yeah, I think that's important. You have to, somebody you look up to, you have to ask yourself, what is it about that person? What are the qualities? I admire in that person that I would like to emulate. Yeah. I want to be you. And then you can take inspiration from a number of people to do that. Any final words, Constance? I was going to say, um, don't don't wait for it to be perfect. Just mm. just if you're if you're thinking, no, I can't do this until I've got everything right, because I felt like that for a long time. I can't do it until I've got it just right. And then no, just just jump in with that little tiny first step. Yeah, whatever. That's a very, very mixed metaphor saying there. But don't don't wait for it to be perfect. Just step out and do it. Whatever that little thing might be to get you started. And that's Alex, actually a weird way. Like, that's actually helpful. It might be more helpful to you and to the world because if you just start integrating small bits of historical dress or whatever your style is, bit by bit by bit, it's almost like you don't. People around you don't even notice. Yeah. All of a sudden, mm. today, everyone wakes up and five years have gone by, and you're a full Edwardian, and people are like, oh. Mm. I don't know when that happened, but yeah. yeah. Like frog. You know, if you okay. heat up the water slowly enough, the frog won't yeah. notice. If you drop it into boiling water, the frog will be like, ah, and jump out. Yeah, it's going to be a diff more difficult transition if you just try and jump into it. More difficult and more expensive transition if you just try and jump yeah. into the yeah. water right now. People rewrite things in their head anyway. I get people who, who've been my friends for many, many years through the DMs and the Tudor clothes stage who went, oh, but you always dress so nicely. And I went, no, I didn't. They've just rewritten to what they see now. I, oh, I know what I really look like. And it was it was terrible. But people, because as I say, I've, I've, I've phased it in to become definitely what I wanted to be. And then that just sort of replaced what was there before and accepted as normal for you it's not oh you suddenly switched that on it's it's just how you are yeah so in terms of baby steps because i was looking for photos of me sort of you know um younger and failing um well no not failing i mean so so because this is me in, yeah and and this is me in florida um and we went to this nature place and i had scorpions and tarantulas all over me um, you know, oh god, it's far oh, yeah. too bright on the thing. But anyway, I'm wearing like a linen waistcoat thing that I picked up from like uh -huh. one of those wedding suit shops, and then like a short sleeve shirt because it was pretty hot. But it, yeah, it is too bright on there, isn't it? But you know, oh, there we go. But but it's um, you know, it it was a step. You know, it's not right. It wasn't great, but it's you know, I was that little bit close to doing what I wanted to do. 
you know you you know it's like baking a cake you know you you can't just have a cake you can buy a cake but you know you you know if you're baking a cake you need to add the ingredients it needs to cook before you have a fully formed cake you can't just throw eggs into a bowl chuck some flour on it and then be like why aren't you a cake yeah speak for yourself i happen to be a witchling and can do that sort of thing that's a good point. That's a good point. I'm actually, um, I'm very, I must now apologize to all of the Wiccans, witches, warlocks, and imps that I may have inadvertently um, offended with my words. I deeply apologize. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's the most important point is like having, having the why in place, knowing why you'd want to do it, and then letting it evolve a little bit at a time. Go on. There's a really important point. There's one thing that you can start doing right now, and What's that's that? hairstyling. Oh. You don't need to buy clothes and spend money on stuff, on, on new clothing, and make it, spend time on making new clothing. One thing that you can start doing right now that will make a world of difference, if you want to start dressing historically, hair and makeup. Yeah. Oh. The fact. Because even if you're wearing historical dress and you don't have the right hair and makeup, it will not look correct, yes. if, you're, if that's what you're going for. But if you're going for historical looks, Right now, even if you're wearing like, I don't know, I'm often seen in a modern blouse and a shorter skirt, but I do my hair all Victorian. People are like, oh, you're, hip. you're, you're dressed like a historical person. No, I'm not. Just from here up. Just the hair. Ah, that's a good point. That's a really good tip. So the best way to start with a hairstyle like mine and Bernadette's is you have a video on your YouTube, because I know people are gonna immediately ask, but I don't know how to do my hair like yours. You have a great basic video about how you do your hair, yeah. which is basically, people ask me all the time now, how do you do your hair? And I'm like, I watched Bernadette's video. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so the first thing yeah, Kathy exactly. and I met- I watched it by lack volume. <laughs> Kathy and I first met, Kathy, one of the first things you did was ask me how I did my hair and then proceed to take pictures of every single angle of how I did. Do you remember that? I did, yeah. You never you did. did, I remember I asking you. Those pictures at St Pancras. And that was when, and that day when you did my hair, it made such a difference. And so I do remember that. I do remember you walked in with, you know, dressed all Victorian and with, with your long hair and you, you looked nice. And then I did your hair and all of a sudden you were walking around with your hair done up with your like Victorian thing in St. Pancras Hotel. And it was like, you just walked out of a time machine. Like you were a different Kathy Hay. So to quote to bag, hair is everything. <laughs> There you go. That's it. Hair is the answer. We figured it out. <laughs> so um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm going to put a QR code up on the screen and share that so you can claim your badge. Let's see if we can break the server again. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much to Bernadette, to Zach, and to Constance. Let's just put you back here um thank you so much Same badge. i hope everybody got the badge. i can put that up again in a minute as we as we finish um so just want to just uh thank you all for being there for being yourselves for being, for being authentic for letting the world enjoy you as you really are and for being an inspiration to so many people so thank you all and just just say a little goodbye to everybody and we will I'll put that QR code back. Thank you all for coming. And you will Thank find you us all on our YouTubes and on our Instagrams. And we will see you soon. Various social medias. Yes. Oh, yeah. Do share. Do share if you have a go now at dressing more historically. Do tag us on, uh, on Instagram and we'll, uh, we'll be able to see you. So have a wonderful evening, everybody. Wonderful evening, morning, day, afternoon. And I will just put that code up again now for the badge. And... Have the rest of a wonderful cocoa bid. See you soon. Bye. 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 Is it over? Are we supposed to like whisper awesome things in the background? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's still. Ah. Oh, we're still going. Right now. <laughs> Everybody oh. thinks we're, go we're not gone. Oh. But we're going to pretend we're gone.
Okay. We're gonna go now, okay? Ready? Oh, okay. Now. Bye. Tell me bye bye. Bars open. <laughs>